So today, uh, we're going to kick off the series, as I mentioned to you. And, and today's sermon is kind of like laying the groundwork. So in this series, we're going to be asking, what does it mean to be a human image-bearing creation with regard to our body, with regard to sex, with regard to gender, with regard to vocation, and all kinds of other things. But not today. Today, we're going to lay the groundwork that we have to lay in order to think successfully and biblically about all of those other things. Today, we're going to ask the question that we all assume we already know the answer to, what in the world are we anyway? And to do that, we will read from Genesis 1, chapter 26, or sorry, verse 26 to verse 28. Here we go. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Lord, help us as we study to understand you and not just comprehend you, but be transformed by you to look more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm super interested in the question of identity, but maybe you show up today and you're like, this is not something I'm really, really bothered by. Well, I think it's something that you should tune into because whether you are interested in the topic or not, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. It's on the campus. It's on TV. It is in advertising. It is everywhere. The question of what a human is, is the question behind every other experience we seem to have together. Let me give you a couple of examples. Every time we experience advertising and someone's trying to sell us something, they're doing so on the basis of anticipating what you would like, what you want, what you need to pursue a good life. Now, you only know what you need to pursue a good life if you have already known or assumed what you are. For instance, because I know what my plants are, I, I don't treat them, you know, to a cheeseburger and a new Netflix series. It wouldn't help them. It doesn't help a plant do what plants are supposed to do. It seems to only help teenage boys do what they're supposed to do. We know what we want because we've already decided or been told what we are and what will get us the good life, what we want to be happy. Here's another example. Um, every time you feel moral outrage... Every time you look at something that has happened or something that has happened to someone else, you see it in reality or you see it on your social media feed or in the news and you feel like that should not be this way, the reason that you feel that that should not be this way is because of some prior beliefs you've already got, whether you know them or not, about what a human is and how they ought to be treated and why they ought to be treated that way. It's also the reason why uh, behind every morally praiseworthy experience that you have, good job! And that's really awesome. We're excited about human flourishing. Maybe some of you have heard this phrase. Harvard has a whole center for human flourishing, and yet I've never seen a very clear definition of what a human is so that we can help it flourish. And that's what we're asking. What does it mean to be us? What does it mean that our identity is a real thing founded not in our proclivities, nor in our activity, nor in our particular aesthetic tastes? What does it mean, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, to have an identity that is in response to who God says we are? What does it mean for us to understand that you becoming you does not start with you? You becoming you does not, cannot, will not, must not start with you, because if it starts with you, you will immediately have started wrong, and you can't get to the right answer. You becoming you doesn't start with you. And that's one of the chief things that we understand from this text. And so in order to guide us through uh, a, a sermon today that frankly is interesting enough to me that I could make last for a really long time, I'm going to limit myself to asking three questions about this particular 
passage of the Bible or this particular idea. If you becoming you doesn't start with you, the first question is, well, then with whom does it start? Not who does it start with because we are Christians and we do not dangle our participles, friends. Okay, <laughs> definitely don't end a sentence with a preposition. That's not right. Who does it start with? With whom does it start? What, what do we, if, okay, if it's not me that it starts with, and what we find out is that it begins, our identity begins with God. John Calvin said, I cannot know myself rightly until I contemplate God. C.S. Lewis said it far more eloquently that for all of the things that humans try to go after and the places in which we try to find our truest selves, we come to realize as followers of Jesus that my truest self is hidden in him. So since it's the case that you becoming you doesn't start with you. Who does it start with? Well, it starts with God. Listen to this. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Side note, who is the us to whom God is speaking? There are two ideas, and I think it's probably both of them. One idea is the, is the uh, council of divine beings that God had already made, right? Angels and whatnot. And then God speaking of himself as an inter-Trinitarian unity and community Theologians have argued over that for a long, long time, and I think that this could probably be both. I'm not sure why those two things have to be against one another. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds and the heavens and the livestock over the earth, every creeping thing. Then, and we really get it dialed in here, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them and he blessed them. Now, we just read the same phrase three times in a row. And when the Bible, particularly Genesis, particularly the first 11 chapters of Genesis, repeat themselves to you, they are clapping in your face. I'm trying to say, pay attention, pay attention, because Hebrew doesn't bold things. They didn't have italics or underline or the big flashy gif. Look here. And it's gif. If you say it's gif, we'll pray for you afterwards. <laughs> well, waded right into that one. Really cheesed someone off there. I'm out of here. We see here that our identity is downstream from God's eternality, not the other way. God made us, and because God made us, we have to look at the one who made us to find out what we are. And what we find out from this text is something absolutely glorious. We bear his image. I cannot tell you how fundamentally earth-shattering this text is for the people and the time to whom it was written. In the ancient Near East, there were two major creation stories. One was a story where two gods fought each other, and the outcome of that fight accidentally was creation, and so humans are like, whoops, and that's it. That's what you are. You are, whoops, that's one of the stories. And then the other story is the story where a god made humans because the god wanted to live in paradise, so humans have to slavishly serve the god. Those were the two creation stories. How fundamentally life-altering must it have been to hear for the first time five, six, seven, eight thousand years ago? Oh, no, 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 there's a different story. God made you, and you look like him, and he blessed you. And he gave you authority and dignity and beauty because you reflect God. How, can you imagine what that must have done to, the, to our ancestors' souls and emotionality? Like, whoa, 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 whoa. If you really believed about yourself that you were just lucky mud, you would live differently. If you really just believed about yourself that you were actually ontologically created to be a slave, you would live differently. But here comes the God who is there, the God of the Bible, saying, no, 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 humans. You were made with destiny. You were made with uh, eternal significance. You look like you. You are you, not because you just happen to come into being, but because you look like him. You are the intentional creation of a divine being so that you, in all of your interesting individuality, might reflect and refract his glory in the way that only you can. Praise God. You look like him. I think that that is absolutely stunning. That means we are not self-sufficient. We are not self-existent. We are derivative beings. And that's great because the one from whom we derive is the greatest conceivable being. 
I don't know if you felt bummed out when you walked into church today, but cheer up. You look like God. I don't know if maybe you look at yourself in the mirror sometimes and go, I don't like what I see. That's okay. God likes what he sees because you look like him. This is amazing stuff. And frankly, like we could just meditate on this for a minute because it's glorious. You, the, your journey of self-discovery doesn't begin with you. It begins with God. And I have to say, and I should have said this up at the beginning, this, this idea of figuring out our identity is dangerous. And just say it's dangerous because it, you could fall into the trap of so thinking about who you are that you no longer think about God. And your Christian experience becomes a tool for your own self-actualization. As if this were like a yoga class or an inspiring TED talk. That's not what that is. That, that makes you God. And we are not, um, we're not all here singing to you. But you're great though. The other thing that you could do is probably the thing that in my flesh I'm more inclined to do is to get annoyed by this topic. Just be like, ugh, whatever. Everybody's a human. Just obey. Like, do what God told you to do. And the danger with that is you would overlook the ways God has handcrafted you and all of the unique things about who you are and all of the intricacies of what your image-bearing status means. And so you becoming you doesn't start with you. It starts with God. But I don't know if you've noticed, there seems to be some problems. There seems to be some things that have gotten in the way. Of course, in the story of Genesis, you know, our first parents turned their backs on God and instead obeyed this lying serpent who develops as a character throughout the text of the Bible. In, in, in thinking that defining themselves would bring them freedom, what it actually ends up doing is enslaving them to their enemy. Does that sound familiar at all? We do this to our own children now. You don't think so? We look at four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds and demand that they start thinking about what they want to be when they grow up. That is an ontology word, my friends. That is not an activity word. Not what do you want to do. What do you want to be? Now we go even further and we throw around the phrase, I identify as this, I identify as that, as if it's some sort of thing you pulled off the shelf and found interesting. May I submit to you that you are far too glorious of a thing to self-reflect early in life and know precisely what you are? May I suggest to you that you are far too significant of a thing, far too majestic of a being to try and figure out who you are by the age of 7, 8, 9, 10, 17, and then as a matter of your humanity, express whatever you find there? I grew up around really, 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 really wealthy people. We were not that wealthy, but my dad built houses for them. And one thing stuck out to me. I never saw a family of millionaires and billionaires that was healthy, ever. My dad and I would play golf with these folks because when you build them houses, that's what you do, I guess. <clears throat> that's what you do in Florida, that's what they all do. That's all it is, golf and Disney World. Uh, and I remember, even as like a little guy, like nine, 10, 11, 12, seeing men who were on their fifth family and who'd gone through like multiple iterations of themselves, probably convinced at each iteration that that was their truest self. My friends, you becoming you cannot, does not, should not, will not start with you. It must start with God. So that takes us to the second question. Why does this matter? Why does this matter? Why does it matter that you become yourself, and it's kind of bound up in one word, capacity. Capacity, man. God, for reasons that are still quite mysterious to me, has decided, has already decided, that the way he wishes to extend the kingdom and the experience of his honor and his glory is through human image bearers. That sounds extremely risky to me. It turns out it has been extremely risky. We have not borne that well all of the time. But if you look at the history of humanity and you find beautiful things, you find the image of God expressing itself through people there. 
But when we also look through the same history and we find horrible things, it is the fundamental breaking and rearranging and disordering of that image there. We're all humans, man. I know that we love to look at the darkest moments of our history and say, well, the people who did that were monsters. No, they were you. They were me. They were humans. And they are not a different species. They're us. I would never do anything like that. Know yourself better, my friend. By just the sheer statistics of it, if we all lived in the Weimar Republic just prior to the beginning of World War II, everyone but one of you in this room would be cheering for the Fuhrer. That's us. There's something beautiful and glorious, but now it's really, really broken. How did it get to be that way? It is the fundamental rearrangement of our capacity. What kind of capacity do I mean? Well, theologians have thought like the image of God and the capacity of the image of God first meant like rationality. And some of you, you like that. Most of you who like that probably go to MIT. <laughs> like, ah, glorious, I knew it. Um, that's it, that's how you all sound. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, and that's true, right? Like God is a rational being. Rationality comes from him, God. But that doesn't seem to hold it all up, right? can't just be rationality. Some, of, some other theologians throughout the history of thinking about this idea have thought it has more to do with like a relational, emotional process. And some of you are like, yeah, all the feels. That's what makes me human. And that's not wrong. I mean, it, God is fundamentally a relationship, right? One God eternally existent in three persons means that God has always been and will always be a unity of community. More recently, others have thought it has to do with our power and our ability that, that what, it, what being an image bearer of God has really to do with is rulership, that God gave them this job, that God told these humans to rule and to go and to make gardens and families and other people and buildings and make the rest of the world look like the garden. We are royal rulers, man. And those of you who are bent more like me go, yes. But the reality is the image of God can't be reduced to any one of those things. It's all three of those things. And I, I, like, I like using a word that... Um, uh, uh, theologian and writer named Michael Heiser used, coined, it's that we are not just human images, we are human imagers. That what we do is part of our imaging status, that we have a, therefore a huge capacity and a moral responsibility to make the world look more like heaven than it does like hell. And the fact of the matter is that when human imagers begin to realize that we are in fact made in the image of God, we see that everything we do matters. Everything we do matters. Everything you do matters because you're significant. Don't you think that's why the devil and all of this horrible, horrible demonic nonsense that comes after some of you to tell you that you don't matter, that everybody hates you, that you'll never amount to anything, that's not just bad mental health. It's demonic. It's anti-human. You are not nothing you do matter. You matter because you look like God. You start to think about, oh my gosh, if people are made in the image of God, then a whole bunch of other things suddenly become not okay. Like, oh, that's why God said, love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord because the way I love you reflects the way I love him because you look like him. So if I hate you, I'm hating him. I'm saying the image of God is ugly. It means immediately racism is out. Like not, not okay, not possible. Can't do it. Classism out. You can't be a better or a more perfect human based on what you earn. Nationalism out. You're not more human if you're American or if you're from some other nation. Nope, nope, that's all out. All of a sudden now we have this capacity to see one another with profound dignity. That matters a lot. It matters a lot. And yet, the brokenness of sin seems to come back over and over and over again and twist and turn and malign these ideas. And it does. It takes the divine image of rationality and uses the human mind to wage war and destroy people. It takes the divine image of relationality 
and twists that into emotional and relational pain and devastation. It takes the divine image of rulership, and you don't have to think too hard about how this goes. And we use power to hurt people. Though we are twisted and bent, we are still human, and we are still significant, and we still bear his image. So, since you becoming you doesn't start with you, and since it really matters, how do we get back? That's the third question. How do we recover our human image or status? How do I become truly myself? Well, let me give you some not great ways. You don't take all of the spiritual gifts tests, right? Like maybe this one will be the one. No. You don't simply go over and over through all of the psychometrics. You definitely don't get into the Enneagram. Um, I, some of you like it. It's okay. I'm just, I'm just, it's not my favorite, but apparently that's because I'm an eight. Um, <laughs> What I mean is you don't discover yourself by endless self-reflection. Like by just going over and over, uh, you know, what, what you like, what you prefer, what your tastes are, what your hopes are, what your dreams are, what your body is. That's not the way, though all of those things are interesting and they matter, that's not, none of those can order you. You're far too significant for that. It's also not the case that you're just to be sort of a blank slate to be formed by society or your family or someone like me. No one else can tell you fully what you are because you bear God's image. One of the most exciting things about being a parent is to see the way these people that my wife and I have made are differently bearing and reflecting and refracting God's image. It's one of the coolest things about making disciples and parenting. How do we get back? Well, the first human really messed it up. The first human led our species into a fallenness that has destroyed lots of lives. So if we're going to get back, and we must, then it stands to reason that we should look for a person who has absolutely crushed humaning. And there's only one of those. There's only one human that has been human perfectly according to original specifications. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. So we find Jesus, the image of the invisible God, putting on flesh, wrapping himself in humanity, robing himself with what it means to be human in all of our foibles and all of our temptations and all of our, our necessities. He comes and lives a perfect human life. He does the human thing perfectly. He doesn't just come as the divine son to bear our sins and to die on a cross and save us from all that stuff, which he does, and that's great. But he also comes as our great example, the first one, the pioneer, the one who goes first and shows us, oh, that's what it means to be human. That's what a human looks like, a real one. And then, get this, he suffers and dies to pay for the fact that we have destroyed the image of God in ourselves and ruin it in other people and given us the ability to come back from that. And then, and then he gives us the Holy Spirit, the very power of God that raised his human body from death now dwells in you so that you can be more like him. That's how you get back. You becoming you doesn't start with you. You becoming you starts with him. That's why the apostle Paul wrote, he, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I began by telling you that the knowledge of what it means to be human is kind of everywhere. And it's underneath all of our ethics and all of our advertising and all of our producing and all of the things that we seem to want and all of the things that we seem to do. The only problem with that is there is no consensus societally on what it means to be human. So those things can never work well. But imagine if we understood more what it meant to be human. 
Imagine if we began to see that my dignity doesn't come from my passport or my bank balance or my skin tone or my age or my body fat percentage or my job. My dignity comes from the fact that I am human, made in the image of God, and so does yours. What what would it be like if you began to actually believe that? Like, what what would happen in your mind? What ideas do you currently entertain that could not live in the same head that believed that you were made in the image of God? Let me ask you one deeper. What would it feel like if this were true? What would it feel like? You know, the last two years, every pastor I talked to, every mental health practitioner I talked to, every psychologist, every therapist, every school teacher, anyone who has an eyeball on young people, the last two years have been emotionally devastating. I've done zero COVID funerals in the last two years, but you know what? I have done a handful of deaths of despair funerals, and so have all my friends. What would it feel like if we really began to believe, hold up, I, I'm God's image. So So if you begin to feel about yourself what God feels about you, if you begin to feel about others what God feels about you, friend, if you've struggled over the last two years, please don't feel like I'm attacking you. I am among you. I'm with you. I I need the reality of who I have been made to be to sink down past my brain and into my heart and then one level deeper into my hands and my feet and my body. As Tyler mentioned when he was giving the offering exhortation, my bo- I'm, not, I'm not a human soul wrapped in a meat suit. I am a human body. So are you. You don't just have one. Your body isn't an ancillary, as we'll find out, to your humanity. It's entangled with it. So what would it, what would it look like if you began to operate in your body as if you bore God's image and like your fundamental nature and the thing that Jesus has redeemed and all of your vocation was somehow wrapped up in your royal ruler representative imager status? Oh, that'd be a pretty cool church. The way that church would treat each other, holy cow. The way discouraged people were encouraged, wow. The way in a world that's tearing itself apart across every conceivable line and vector, we just loved one another well here. Look, we're not gonna do it perfectly. I'm not, I'm not advertising that. But the more and more we understand what we are, the more and more we will be what we're supposed to be. You can't be who you're supposed to be without understanding who you are. And you becoming you doesn't start with you. It starts with God, particularly the God-man, Jesus Christ. If we trust in him, we get our identity no longer from our first father, Adam, but we begin to have a renewed identity from the second and greater Adam, Jesus. And so my invitation to you today, some of you have never looked upon Jesus with faith to derive your identity I want to invite you to do that. No matter what you feel like it might compete with, no matter what you feel like, I don't know how that'll all sort everything else up. That's okay. The Bible says, seek first God's kingdom. Everything else will sort itself out. Some of you today, like for the first time, can come to God and go, okay, Dad, you tell me who I am. Dude, the self-discovery is exhausting. It's exhausting. What a terrible burden. Keep figuring yourself out. Present yourself to us when you're done and you keep trying over and over again, and it doesn't ever produce the results you were hoping for, maybe that's because who you are is to be found in him. Is that not what Colossians says? For I have, you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Others of you, you're here, and you've got all kinds of questions. I really want to encourage you to come to that seminar. Really, really, really want to encourage you, because God loves you, and he wants to renew what it means to be his image bear. Let's pray. God, thank you for our time together. I thank you for the men and women in this room. God, I, I, I love that we are humans made in your image. You are so generous that you've given us minds that are kind of like yours and we can be relational kind of like you and, and, and we can exercise authority in the world that you've given us. This is all amazing stuff, God. Forgive us for the ways we've done it wrong. Forgive us for the ways that we have 
and man manipulated the authority and the power and the dignity that you've given us and others. Oh God, would you show us what it means to be an image bearer well by showing us more and more of who Jesus is, the image of the invisible God, who experienced death and the outcome of our own sins so that we might experience life and the renewal of God's image in us. Oh God, show us. I pray in Jesus' name, I pray that you would do this for us.